lost his mind. Maybe in this case, Darius and, you know, the rest of the aristocracy was simply doing the logical, common sense thing in that situation. Who knows? To those historians who suggest that what we may have here when Darius comes to power is some sort of an oligarchic coup, he writes in the inscription on the side of the mountain, quote, Darius the king says, These are the men who at that time were there when I slew Gaumata the Magus, who called himself Bardia. At that time, these men cooperated as my followers. And he goes on to name specifically, you know, six co conspirators, the other members of the assassination hit team, one by one. And then he says, quote, You who shall be king hereafter, protect well the offspring of these men. End quote. How many descendants over a hundred years, let's just say, although the Persian Empire existed closer to 200, how many people can be the offspring of those six original conspiratorial Force 10 from Navarone comrades? The descendants of the assassins may have ended up being like an oligarchy in the Persian Empire, or maybe a better way to phrase it is like an oligarchy on top of the already existing oligarchy, a creme de la creme, the descendants of the hit team members. In Greek literature, they will usually be referred to as the seven, and being one of the seven may have been the equivalent of having your place in Persian society literally carved into stone by one of the greatest kings the Persian Empire ever produced. I've always seen the seven, you know, Darius and his six co-conspirators, a little like the initial investors in an assassination-related startup company, in this case a startup company devoted to assassinating a ruler and taking the throne over, and if that's the case and it really did put those people into a permanent different class, well, that's a heck of a long-term dividend return that paid off until basically the end of the empire. Not a bad deal. Historian Pierre Briand is one of some of the newer ones who question the entire idea behind this special class, by the way. Some of the newer historians suggest that these six Persians that were the co-conspirators, that that number might have been chosen for religious reasons, that there maybe weren't six or more than six or less than six. Also, that it just so happens that these people may simply represent the powerful, you know, noble clans of Persia anyway. So the people that already were kind of the oligarchy in Persia just get their status reaffirmed. Doesn't matter which one of these scenarios, though, that explains you know, this weird period between the end of Cambyses' reign and the beginning of a reign of a guy who doesn't seem to have any connection to the royal family, Darius, doesn't matter which one of those scenarios are true. And by the way, we only scratch the surface on the many that are out there. They're all pretty darn wild and woolly. All of them would make a good film. Personally, I think the best one is, you know, this event's version of like the Warren Commission report, the official narrative of Darius makes the best movie, if you ask me get Herodotus to do the screenplay, Oliver Stone to direct it, make sure there's some Lucas sound, I'm in. It's stuff like this that make this maybe the best coup d'etat slash assassination slash regime change conspiracy story out there. I mean, it's fantastic. Doesn't matter which one of them turns out to be true, though. By 521 BCE, the end result is this guy Darius is on the throne. And he's got, maybe you could say, a legitimacy deficit. Maybe the only thing he's lacking. And it causes him problems right away. He's very open about this in this autobiographical account, you know, carved into the mountainside. He lists all the places that rebel against his rule. He has to fight, he says, 19 battles in a year and a half to three years to quell all of the uprisings. And... These places in Persia that are rebelling are some of its most important provinces, large places, right? Egypt, for example. And they're not rebelling 
so that they can band together and support some sort of rival claimant to the throne? Because historians think there might have been a bunch of people in the empire that thought they had as much of a connection to the throne as this Darius guy. It looks instead like they're all kind of going rogue at the same time, like they want their independence back. They all seem to have kings that sprout from nowhere, that are claiming royal descent from the last independent line all these places had, right? And in the same way that Darius on the mountainside inscription says that Galmata lied about being Bardi, remember the Persians have this thing about lying, basically number one on their cultural naughty list at this point. And so when he says they lied, that's pretty bad. But then he goes on to say that all of these kings in all of these provinces that have rebelled, that are claiming descent from the old royal family that used to exist there before the Persians showed up, they're all lying. Historians refer to all these kings as the liar kings. Darius would have to go from place to place to place, fighting battle after battle after battle. He would send his generals to go fight some of these battles too had to conquer Babylon more than once. You'll love this. One of the liar kings that pops up also claims to be Bardia. So this would be the second Bardia that shows up on the scene. This is the, the zombie now, other son of Cyrus, that cannot be killed. And I love the way, by the way, Darius on the mountainside inscription gives the orders to his forces to go quell these rebellions. He says the same thing every time, which probably means it's ritualized and somewhat, but, but it's still wonderful, you know, old school, ancient stuff, terminology. He says, quote, Go forth and defeat the rebellious army, which will not call itself mine. End quote. And then as he captures these, you know, rebel leaders, the ones who tie themselves to the old, you know, royal family from long ago, he treats them all pretty darn badly. Sometimes they only show up in pieces. The Elamites, when they find out he's basically on the way, they kill their own independent king themselves and send body parts to Darius. That's sort of like saying, oh, we're sorry. But when he gets his hands on the whole liar king one at a time, he treats them like this. This involves one that rebelled in Medea named Phraortes, which is a Greek version of a name that's famous in Median history, so rooted in the old royal family, and then Darius got his hands on him. He writes on the Byzantine inscription on the mountainside, quote, Darius the king says, Afterwards, Phraortes fled with a few horsemen. There is a district in Medea, Raga by name, and there he went. After that I sent an army in pursuit. Phraortes was seized and led to me. I cut off his nose, ears, and tongue, and I put out one of his eyes. At my gate he was kept bound, and all the people looked at him. After that I impaled him at Ecbatana, and in the fortress at Ecbatana I hanged the men who were his foremost followers. I executed his nobles, a total of forty-seven. I hung their heads inside Ecbatana from the battlements of the fortress. End quote. Now we said the Persians were more tolerant than a lot of the earlier empires in the region, but that's graded on a curve. This is still the ancient period where the sorts of treatments of prisoners and captives and people on the other side of justice, for example, more resembles the stuff that the very worst of the terrorists in our world today do. That's often part of the legal codes of these early societies. You know, I'm fascinated by the extremes of the human experience. And when you go far back in time, you see them everywhere. I mean, I was reading, for example, the process by which impalement as an execution is carried out in some places and sometimes. I think in our heads we just think there's a sharpened stake sticking out of the ground. You throw the victim up, they land on the stake, impalement done. No muss, no fuss. Well, basically. But instead I'm reading about, you know, a whole thing where they, they use a razor blade in advance. In some of these places they would then put something on to stop the bleeding fix you up a little bit so it went the way they wanted. Um, greasing the the stake, I mean, things that just you, you, doesn't make any sense to the modern mind. And you think about the people who did this, and you think that they almost sound like a different species, don't they? But they're not. You could take a little newborn baby out of a modern hospital, put him in a time machine, send him back to ancient Persia, hand them off to a childless couple there, and 
go back in 20 years to check on how the modern kid's doing being raised in the ancient world, and they'll probably be able to explain to you the logical, common-sense, moral rationale behind impaling people. They might even explain to you that they enjoy watching it. Times change, of course, but we human beings are an interesting species, aren't we? Nonetheless, as horrifying as all that sounds, when you grade the Persians on a curve, they still come out as a rather lenient people by the standards of the place and time. The way that Darius handles the many revolts and uprisings and the need to placate whole areas and put in new structures and to keep fires from breaking out again is a foreshadowing of what's to come when it comes to the ability of this figure, Darius, who will eventually be called the Great. His gifts, though, are a little bit unusual for you know, the kings of kings, these heads of state, especially you know, from the Persian tradition where they're always thought to be like warriors like Cyrus the Great, these you know, leaders on horseback continually pushing the empire at the head of their troops. Darius is a little bit more like a you know, white-collar worker, like a desk job guy. Herodotus says the Persians had a saying, and they said that Cyrus was the father, Cambyses the tyrant, and Darius the shopkeeper. Which, if you believe what people like Herodotus have written about the Persians, and a lot of aristocratic peoples have felt this way over time, they sort of disdained as rather, you know, lower class by their standards, things like mercantilism, getting your hands dirty with money, business, commerce, anything like that. Of course, in the modern United States and much of the world, well, that's maybe the most, you know, highly thought of profession. And in a way, shopkeeper, which sounds a little like a slam at Darius, if you think about the size of the shop Darius was running, he was running Walmart. And we don't call those people shopkeepers, we call them CEOs. And when you look at Darius, that's what he looks like, a modern CEO. Which does make you wonder, again, about how he gets the job, because he seems so suited to it, you can't help but think he's some sort of process of natural selection, you know, as part of his cast. I mean, we were only choosing from the aristocracy, but that's a heck of a bigger talent pool than trying to choose from two sons of Cyrus. Isn't that always the problem with monarchy, right? Such a small talent pool to pick from. In some countries, you have to pick the oldest son, and then there's no chance at all. That's just a roll of the dice. Darius may have been the most capable amongst, you know, the nobility of Persia because he seems exactly what the empire needs at this time. He is overly concerned with money is sort of the stereotype. He thinks about profit and loss, and he's an administrator and a person who organizes. Today we would think of him as a consultant who comes in and streamlines operations. I mean, he's credited, for example, with starting the satraps and the satrapies, which probably isn't true. He probably didn't start it, but he certainly reorganized the empire in a sort of a lasting way. He would handle things sometimes in a very cutthroat manner, sometimes in a very innovative manner, and in other ways in a, in a very deft manner weighing his options you know, clever is what they would say about him in some of the histories I've read when they wanted to be nice, but that could swing over into conniving, you know, when, when the pendulum moved too far in a different direction. You think about a guy like Steve Jobs, maybe, or some of those CEOs, not the ones who just go collect a paycheck or the ones who get paid $123 million and, and the stock's cut in half since I've been here. You think about the people who really, you know, have something to them where you go, okay, I, I, I may not like this guy or I may love this guy, but you can see that there's some genius there. And sometimes the genius is in things that maybe seem kind of mun mundane, you know? I mean, it's one thing to see an artistic or performance genius. It's another thing to see an administrative one. But when they're working their wonder sometimes, the benefits are incredible. And when you look at Darius and how he took the Persian Empire, essentially you could call it a startup company at the beginning. This is when it goes public, and Darius is when it gets its first really high-level CEO who takes it to the next level. There's a lot that has to be done to make that happen, and a lot of people in the empire might not have liked it very much, which is another reason you have, you know, 19 battles you have to fight sometimes to quell all the fires that are springing up.
But the difference between the empire when this guy takes over and how he leaves it is profound. There's a reason a guy comes out of nowhere in terms of his royal lineage, ends up probably number two on the greatest Achaemenid Persian kings of all time. He's a highly energetic, highly competent, long-ruling figure who becomes important in the story as far as Westerners have been concerned for more than 2,000 years because he is the one that starts mixing it up with the Greeks. And supposedly, when I was growing up, Western civilization considered the Greeks the home team. This story is kind of a chance to highlight things from the visiting team's point of view in the battle for Western civilization. Of course, as we pointed out earlier, that's pretty hard to do when you were working mostly with the equivalent of the home team's newspapers. And the way we've structured this story is to just do every king in the Achaemenid Empire, one after another in order, as sort of the structure of this show. But so far, we've been dealing with kings that are so important, and the sources, especially the hometown newspapers and Western civilization, are so, you know, full of things involving them that we've been able to go into them in loving detail. There will be whole kings that we will almost fast forward through. And it isn't because they didn't do anything. It's because if they didn't do anything to or with the Greeks, we don't know a lot about them. And what you do have is mostly what archaeological evidence can show you and things like that. So there will be kings that might have done a bunch of things very interesting over off in India or up in modern-day Afghanistan or down in, you know, the area around southern Egypt today. Who knows? If the Greek sources didn't write about it, sometimes we don't know about it, in which case some of these kings are going to get short shrift indeed. Cyrus, Cambyses, Darius, these are some of the heavyweights in the Achaemenid Empire. And like a lot of empires, their leadership is sort of front-loaded which is why it does so well for a while. If you can tie competent or inspired leadership to, you know, the, the good fortunes of an empire, well, at this point, the Persian Empire is on the upswing, and leadership is a large part of it, and Darius is, perhaps in terms of total competency overall, maybe the best they ever had. He concerns himself with the boring side of government, things like, you know, we would say today, monetary policy, He's very famous, for example, for instituting maybe the first metal coinage in the region outside of Lydia, which is famous for having started metal coinage, certainly in that region. The gold coins will be called derricks after him. Shekels will be the silver coin. And the Persian gold and, and, and the wealth of the empire will become an absolutely you know, hallmark element of it. They're known for having a lot of money, and they use it. And, of course, there's nothing new, right, in using bribes and money as a foreign policy tool and all that sort of stuff. Nothing new about that. That goes back to time immemorial. And, you know, during the period we're talking about here, um, maybe only the Chinese, though, are doing it on a comparable level to what the Achaemenid Persian Empire is doing. And some of this plays into this CEO style of Darius, too. Things are purely weighed on a profit and loss sort of criteria. And if, you know, we can solve this military problem without having to fight a war, let's do it that way. You know, that kind of an approach. He's concerned, for example, I mean, you can tell he's concerned, like all Persian kings, with the status of the office and protecting the authority and the reputation and all those kinds of things. But, you know, I mean, if there's something that comes up where we can talk about some sort of a deal, I'm not you know, totally closed-minded to it. There are empires that have come around that have much more of a machismo to them where we don't, you know, deal. What do you mean deal? Do what I say or else. Whereas the Persians are kind of perennially open for business, if you will. I like, and let's be honest, there could be some ritualization to this, but I like what Darius himself has carved on his, you know, he, he's buried on a mountainside eventually, and he will have a carving, sort of, you know, what he decided he wanted on his tomb. And he emphasized sort of the you know, thinking man's approach to running an empire. On the tomb of Darius, it says, quote, I am not hot-tempered. What things develop in my anger I hold firmly under control by my thinking power. I am firmly ruled over my own impulses. I have a strong body. As a soldier, I am a good soldier. I see who will rebel and who will not. First I will think, then I will act. End quote. There's an ancient line that money is the sinew of war. 
and the Persians were not dominant militarily at everything, and in the areas where they lacked something, the ability to come up with a ton of cash as needed could compensate for a lot of those shortcomings. And believe me, a guy like Darius understood that better than anyone. Historian Pierre Briant runs down Darius's qualities a bit and then points out how, you know, much of a change the period that he inaugurates in Persian history is. He says in a chapter subheading entitled A New Foundation for the Empire, quote, The ways and means of Darius's accession to power, to the extent that we can reconstruct them, are a testimony to the new king's energy and decisiveness. Darius was undeniably an exceptional personality, but he also proved to have organizational ability. During the same time that he was reorganizing the entire tribute system, other projects were carried out in various regions. Construction of new capitals, the conquest of Samos, expeditions from the Indus to the Nile. In the year 518, he also commissioned the satrap, Ariandes, to gather Egyptian sages to collect the quote-end-quote Egyptian laws. Other measures affecting Jerusalem were affected at the same time. What is striking, he writes, is the care with which the king planned for the long term, end quote. Then discussing the era that he inaugurates due to his energetic efforts to, you know, create the support system long term for something, Briand writes, quote, Without in the least deprecating the work accomplished by his predecessors, we may thus assert that the advent of Darius marks the foundation of a new dynastic and imperial order. In this regard, the first years of his reign definitely represent a decisive period in Achaemenid history. End quote. One of the revisions to the structure of things that Darius works out is the succession. And he tries to create the conditions so that the way he came to power will never happen again. One of the first things he did, this is a traditional thing, by the way, to do after a coup or a toppling of an old regime in the Middle East. You want to marry into the previous royal family, because remember, if this is all about sort of genetic blue blood. Even if a king is a bad guy or the regime is, is, is overthrowable and it would be a good thing, doesn't mean you don't want that blue blood in your lineage. It can go back to like, you know, pulling the sword out of the stone type legendary beginnings. You want to have that in your bloodline. So Darius takes care to marry two daughters of Cyrus the Great and his granddaughter. Some of these, the previous wives of Cambyses, by the way. So in a way, I think of like the Ford Motor Corporation and Henry Ford, the big founder. Maybe he's like Cyrus the Great. And then, you know, Henry Ford's son takes over the company. And then by hook or by crook, Colonel Mustard may intervene. Who knows? All of a sudden, you have this guy who wasn't in the family tree, not the direct one anyway, maybe a second cousin or something, and he's running the Ford company. And then all of a sudden, he marries, you know, the daughters and granddaughter of Henry Ford. Maybe one of these was married to Henry Ford's son. Who knows? But eventually... You know, some guy from outside the direct line of the Ford family is running Ford Motor Company. Here's the thing, though. He may not be a member of the Ford family, but his kids will be. So that's how you tie yourself back into the early royal line. You may change a few statues and, you know, hide your tracks a little bit, too, in your building projects. Historians are starting to think that they see more and more that the entire lineage of Darius connecting him to the great Cyrus of old may have been sort of forged in reverse, reverse legitimacy, as we called it earlier. Once again, smart. Darius becomes the king that expands Persian authority more to the east of the empire, which is, which is territory that because the Greeks didn't know much about, you don't hear much about. You know that it happens, though, because soon you'll have satraps in the east that are Indian, essentially. What, what's now modern-day Pakistan is the part of India that the Persians conquered one way or another. And as far as the ancient Greeks were concerned, that was like the end of the known world. They didn't know about anything maybe that existed past that. That could be dragons, unicorns, or, you know, hostile barbarians as far as the eye could see. Maybe the Persians knew, but they weren't telling Herodotus. Darius will do some more conquests, you know, in, in northeastern Africa, but this is kind of like, it's, it's almost like the blob a little bit. I mean, he just, the Persian Empire goes from these amazing, you know, startup company type growth rates to a steady, you know, healthy growth rate where the empire is expanding nicely, thank you very much, but not so fast that we can't incorporate everything nicely and absorb everything 
appears to be the inevitable long-term outcome of things. If you're looking at a map of this region, you know, in 515, 514, 513 BCE, because the Persian Empire looks like, you know, the 1950s horror movie blob, slowly, you know, advancing in all directions and spreading out and just, you know, naturally absorbing everything on the fringes. And while there are certainly natural limitations an empire could run into, might reach the limits of communication, for example, or run into climate and environmental things you can't deal with. I mean, I'm sure the Persian army in this period can defeat the Indian army in the interiors of India, but can you deal with the jungles and the snakes and the weather and all that? Ask Alexander in a couple of hundred years how much of an impediment that's going to be. You know, can you deal with transportation questions? And of course, revolts are always a threat, especially the larger you get. But who's going to act as any kind of a military counterforce to the great king and the Persians as things stand, you know, around 515, 514 BCE? Look at a map. Who's there? There's no one to have World War III with. The Chinese, they'd be a fun fantasy matchup, but they're on the other side of the world in their own little civilizational bubble, if at all aware of the Persians, simply probably through, you know, some traders who actually make the long journey, but who knows? So those armies aren't fighting. So who is going to stop the blob from taking over literally everything until they reach their natural limits? Well, that's what makes this story so compelling. That's what sets it up for the movie that Herodotus is going to give you when he explains to you how, you know, this David will beat this Goliath, how someone will stop the blob, and by the way, thereby save everyone. Like so many other people who've been interested in the Persian army from this period, I became interested in them because I was interested in the Greeks. And the Persians are the uber adversary, the arch nemesis, right, of the Greeks from the, you know, classical era. And after a while, you know, you become a little curious about these people that, you know, the classical authors mostly portray. But, you know, you even get this up until the modern time as sort of zombies or orcs who only are formidable because of their numbers. But their numbers are so huge that they're massively formidable. Millions of them. They drink rivers dry. There are so many of them. And you become kind of curious about these people, you know, once you get past these numbers after a while. And once you get into it, the Persians become so fascinating because they're the final installment of the ancient military system of the Near East, the final development. And that doesn't really mean the apex of its development because it's possible that that happened during Assyrian times, but the last of the armies fielded on principles that were developed in Sumeria and nurtured by peoples like the Assyrians and the Babylonians before them, inheritors to a 2,500-year-old military tradition, is what historian Nigel Tallis says. And once you get rid of the very large numbers that the classical authors give you, turning them into orcs, you realize how good they must have been at what they did. I mean, if there weren't millions of them, Look how nasty the smaller numbers of them were. Look what they did. Look what they conquered. If you believe the ancient authors and you're thinking, well, of course they conquered all of them. There were millions of them. They swarmed over the defenders. But if there weren't millions of them, if there were roughly equal numbers, then all of a sudden the fighting quality of these Persian armies, which it always assumed to be relatively low, gets increased you know, by a lot. And, and the quality begins to look like the kind of quality you would have to have to win an empire like this and to hold it. And we told you in the first part of this story when we were talking about Cyrus the Great and he was doing all these conquests with his army and we kept talking about his army, but we couldn't really discuss what that army was like because they don't really know. It's a shame too because that's an army worth knowing about, right? Look what that did. But by the time of Darius the Great, sort of the mists part a little bit and give you a look into the military organization and the equipment and whatnot um, of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. And by Darius, I don't know if you could say it's the height of military development, but they're still fighting at a very high level. They are a veteran army that fights a lot. So they have a lot of actual practical real world experience. And the army is relatively unbeaten. They have a setback here or there sometimes, but by and large, 
you know, the places they want to conquer, they conquer. Good luck, though, getting any agreement amongst modern-day historians concerning exactly how they did this. Because just because they've, you know, done away with those crazy numbers from the ancient sources, the two million men type things, doesn't mean that they've figured out any better ones automatically that everyone agrees upon. The numbers that the Persian armies brought to the battlefield, not the entire number available to the empire if they mustered everybody, but these battles that are famous that involve the Persian army, how many men were there? Well, when you see that it ranges from a low of like 12 to 15,000 men and a high of like 250 or 300,000 men, you begin to see what a huge difference you know, these different peoples have on how this army operated. Just to give you one example, it's well known that a core, you would call them maybe guards today, existed in this army, 10 to 12,000 men strong, you know, when you incorporate the extra super royal guards, and that these troops were superior in general to most of the other troops on the battlefield. They were what you would call today regulars. They may have been drilled, right? The best troops in the army. If your army is 300,000 men and 10 to 12,000 of them are these guys, well, you might not even be able to call them the tip of the spear in an army that large. They may just be the king's guard. If, on the other hand, these armies are closer to 25 or 30,000 men strong in reality, well, then a guard of 10 to 12,000 regular drilled troops is a third to half your entire army. That's a huge difference, isn't it? That's a much better army. So right there, that would impact, you know, the impression of how these armies did what they did. I will say that as a fan of the Persian army, it's been wonderful over the last 20, 25 years to really see a more modern view of how the army fought and was organized crystallize. Very exciting. And this could change, by the way, down the road. I mean, this is just the latest interpretation of the evidence. It should also be pointed out that when I talk about the Persian army, this is an empire that stretched over 200 years. The army will change and evolve and, and, and become different, you know, from the start of the empire to the end of the empire. We are freeze-framing a moment in time here, but it's a moment that, according to the Greek sources, pretty much determined whether or not Western civilization would continue, so it's worth focusing on. It's also worth focusing on because the majority of historians for more than 2,000 years have pinpointed the reason that history went the way it did down to a question of weapon systems on the battlefield and how they interacted. As strange as that sounds, I know, because we normally think of, you know, the things that impact history as being either massive sort of forces like industrialization, mixing with colonization, mixing with a newly unified and very nationalistic Germany, looking for their place in the sun, all those things together, boom, you have a history-changing moment, right? Or maybe it's the extraordinary individual who comes along at just the right time and, you know, catches a few breaks here or there, and boom, you have Genghis Khan or Julius Caesar or Oliver Cromwell or Tecumseh. And most of the time, obviously, it's a combination of things, right? The extraordinary individual showing up just at the time the colonization, you know, is going the way it's going and Germany needs its place in the sun, right? All those things working together, boom, you have a historical moment. But another one of those areas where history can turn seems almost banal by comparison, but it can come down to the simple question of weapon systems on the battlefield. And remember, in this era we're talking about, the battlefield is like, you know, 2,500 yards long, maybe, just on average. And the decision point happens in a couple of hours or an afternoon. And it can be determined by something... You know, if you go back to, well, the majority of historians, even now probably, but certainly the way Herodotus saw it, to a question of something like whether or not you're armed with a spear or a bow, or whether or not your weapon system includes a lot of body armor or doesn't. And if you think that that's a little kooky, well, if you think about one side having firearms and the other side not, you can see what a difference a weapon system differential could make to an outcome of a battle. And I don't have to convince you, do I, that the way battles and wars turn out, you know, have a huge impact on the way history goes, right? Imagine if you lost the Second World War. It's going to look a little different, isn't it? So a great many historians 
for more than 2,000 years have boiled down to why things happened the way they happened to a question of how armies interacted with each other, Greek armies and Persian armies. So you have to understand the Persian army that's going to go into these conflicts with the Greeks to understand what happened if those historians are right. The first thing to understand is that the Persian army, you know, to, to we ancient history war gamers, and I know you're out there, to us, this is the army you get when you like a lot of bow fire. I mean, like machine gun level bow fire. A buddy of mine once said that you could historically justify giving every single person in the army during this time period a bow if you want to. But how many arrows does it take to blot out the sun? During his story of the last stand of the 300 Spartans, remember those Clint Eastwood types in bronze, Herodotus tells a story of a local person who goes up to one of the Spartans and says, you know, that the Persian archers are so numerous that when they shoot their arrows, they hide the sun. And the famous one-liner that comes back, you know, the bravado from the sure-to-die Spartan was something to the effect of, that'll be great because then we can fight in the shade. But it's indicative of what this Persian army was known for, archery. And is it hyperbole to suggest that they could blot out the sun with it? Don't you wish you had video of one of these ancient battles to get some idea of what we're talking about here and the capabilities? I've said many times that if I ever get that time machine, I want to be, you know, transported into a hot air balloon floating about 100 feet over one of these ancient battlefields so I can see, you know, what's going on. I'll answer 100 questions in about a minute and a half. As soon as I can just visualize it, there's no video. It'd be very gory and awful if there were, but I'd look at it just to try to get a picture of what we're talking about here. We haven't done this in so long, nobody knows what it was like. It's the same thing when I was studying Western sword fighting techniques. Nobody knows that either. Everybody's trying to recreate how people did medieval sword fighting with a longsword based on still two-dimensional images from books because no one kept alive the art form, say, the way the Japanese did with their sword fighting techniques, right? That's alive and well, but nobody knows for sure even with some pretty darn good recreations out there, how Western sword fighting did it. You don't do something for a while, you don't have video of it, yet you lose the ability to understand it totally. Same thing with these ancient battles, right? Oftentimes these ancient authors that you would use as your, your best pieces of evidence to explain and colorize what it all looked like leave out the most important parts of the story because to them it's just known stuff, right? I don't have to explain the most basic stuff to you. Everybody understands what happens when, for example, two blocks of human beings, you know, a thousand men strong, run into each other during a charge, right? Well, no, I don't know what happened there, and neither do historians. And if I was in my hot air balloon 100 feet over the battlefield, I would finally be able to answer the question, do those blocks of human beings actually run into each other? and go face-to-face, tooth-to-tooth, toe-to-toe in a claustrophobic, horrible scrum, you know, where people are so cramped together they can hardly use their weapons, and the people in the front row are being squished to death by the people in the back and, and, and pushed onto the spears of their adversaries? Is that how it goes? Or is it more like other historians have theorized, where at the last second there's something inherent in human beings where they won't throw themselves on the weapons of their enemies, and they stop with a four- or an eight-foot gap between the two blocks of human beings, a no-man's land, if you will, where they're stabbing and throwing stuff across the gap and champions are running out from each side and challenging each other in the no-man's land and other brave people are running across to the other side and grabbing somebody out of the ranks and pulling them back to their side. Is that how it was? There's other historians who split the difference and say that the units run into each other for a second and then, you know, over the first minute and a half or two minutes or whatever, slowly pull back from each other, creating that dead space in the middle. But nobody knows. Nobody knows if cavalry will charge infantry or under what conditions. I mean, there's just stuff that's still debated by the experts because how would we know? You can do some mathematics, though, if you're not terrible at math, and I'm not that good, but I was able to handle round numbers like this, to try to get an idea of certain capabilities. One of the wonderful things about ancient warfare is that even if you can't know what it was like, you can understand that there are certain realities to it, physical laws, if you will, let's call it the physics of the battlefield in pre-gunpowder times, that are limited by you know, certain bedrock elements that don't change. 
human beings, for example, horses, other flesh and blood creatures like camels and elephants that are often used in battles. There's a limit to human endurance. There's a limit to human morale. There's a limit to muscle power. And those sorts of, you know, constraints were operating in the armies of the Pharaoh in ancient Egypt, all the way to the armies of Richard II, the Lionheart, you know, in the Holy Land during the Crusades. There's something about, you know, battle over the eras until gunpowder takes over, where commanders from different eras could have commanded armies from other eras and not been too deep out of the water for them to understand, you know, what they were dealing with, because certain elements didn't change. When you're talking about the sorts of armies that these great states threw against each other, they generally included, you know, close order infantry as, as sort of the rock around which you built your army, the battle line, you would say, in some periods. A good estimate for a traditional set piece battle with a Persian army might be a 2,500 or 3,000 yard or meter front. Think about, you know, 25 or 30 football fields long and a solid line of men across a ton of that space. The battle line would generally make up maybe if you wanted to just get a off the top of your head estimate, say 70 to 75% of each army's side is made up of these phalanxes, units of men packed shoulder to shoulder next to each other and keeping that packed nature of things, staying together, and then multiple ranks behind them. The rank depth changed, and if you had four ranks behind you, that's a pretty shallow formation. In the Hellenistic period, you'll get some Hellenistic phalanxes that'll go 72 men deep. The armies of this period's Near East tended to be organized decimally. So the smallest unit would be 10 men, then up to 100, then 1,000. We're told the Persians had 10,000 man units. The tweak that the Persians are supposed to have made, modern historians think, to the age-old formations of the Assyrians and the Babylonians has to do with how many ranks of archers they have versus how many ranks of spearmen. Historian Nigel Tallis is one of many who points out that the Assyrians thought, and the Babylonians copied them, that you needed to have half of your units ready for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the other half could be armed with missile weapons. And so what they would do is pack the front half of the unit with the spearmen, you know, with a big spear, heavy, big shield, a helmet if you could, an armor if you could. And so if you had a formation that was eight ranks deep, the first four in the Syrian army would usually be the hand-to-hand -hand combat guys, the rear four, the archers, and the archers would shoot over the head of the spearmen. It creates a very flexible formation. Any enemy that won't come to grips with you, you can strike from a distance. Any enemy you want to advance on and close with, you can weaken before your spearmen have to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Anyone who just sits there, you can shoot for a while. And anyone who comes at your unit, you can kill on the way in, making an easier job for your spearmen when they finally get to you. Historians think that the Persians tweaked that formation by taking out most of the ranks of close order infantry, the spearmen, and replacing them with archers, often archers with little or no armor and no shields. Most of these Persian units are going to have a front rank of spear armed, shielded, often armored, but not always infantry that protect the archers behind them. They have a shield that's made of wicker, but that looks like a boogie board for you Americans, a, a, almost a, a man-sized tall wicker plank, cut square. And it looks like when all the front rank decided to close together, those things are going to fit together like a perfect wall. So imagine, you know, 70 to 75 percent of your 2,500 to 3,000 yard front has a wall of wicker shields in front of it protecting you know your archers from any missile fire back but your archers are shooting over the heads of those troops and just blowing people away so i did some calculations assuming low numbers at every step imagine a 50,000 man persian army which would be a low number believe it or not imagine that in that battle line that the persians have probably increased the firepower over assyrian versions by you know 20 or 30 percent more Imagine that 20,000 archers are in that main battle line. Each archer fires about five arrows a minute, and their quivers carry 120, but just for the sake of argument, we'll say that they're not full, and we'll give them all 100 arrows each. That means that across that battle line, 
where these troops who are sitting behind the wall of wicker shields are shooting, they're shooting 100,000 arrows a minute from the main battle line, you know, to a distance of about 200 yards in front of the army. Beyond that, they can shoot, but effective range is 175 to 200 yards. They can keep up this fire for as long as their muscles will hold out or until their arrows run out, which at that rate would be after about 20 minutes of shooting. And after 20 minutes of shooting, they would have fired 2 million arrows. Now, infantry with armor might be able to withstand that, but if you're on a horse in front of that crowd, you're dead. If you're driving a chariot, you're gone. You don't get anywhere near the battle line, right? You're blown away at a distance. That's a great sort of military change that they made over the Assyrians if you're fighting the kind of enemies the Persians usually are. They improved those Assyrian formations, unless, of course, enemy, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat troops finally get to you. Here's the way historian Nigel Tallis talks about, you know, this change that the Persians did to tweak the traditional Assyrian formation, quote, it is likely that a battle array of this kind would be highly effective when facing the large mounted forces known in the Near East since at least the second millennium BC. A horse is a large and vulnerable target for archery. Well-equipped infantry is less vulnerable, as the Persians were to discover. It is probable that Achaemenid formations followed the Elamite tradition of maximizing the number of archers in the infantry units, unlike the Assyrians, who seem to have maintained a 50-50 ratio of archers to shielded spearmen. End quote. Now, it's tempting to think of all this as minutia, right? Wargamer geek stuff. But if the majority of historians for more than two millennia are right, this is the kind of minutia that determines why these battles we're about to talk about go the way they do. Now, whereas the majority of the Persians in this time period are going to be in that battle line we just talked about, they're also going to have some cavalry, and the Persians had great cavalry. I've often thought of the Persian army in this period as a more, for lack of a better word, barbarized version of the Assyrian army at its height. And I often compare it to like ancient Rome. If you look at the Roman Empire at their height, it's so tempting to see them almost as like the Nazi Germany era, where they're all marching in almost lockstep, goose step formation with intricate precision, immaculate drill. You know, everybody's sleeping in the barracks, everyone professional and the whole thing. And then I think of the Roman Empire, you know, a couple hundred years later, where the armies lost some of that spit and polish. And instead of having everybody or the majority of troops, you know, at the top being Roman, you have, you know, some barbarians, the Romans would call them, tribal peoples, more aristocratic. I mean, Hans Delbruck calls the Persians from this period the cavalry knights. So imagine, you know, the, a more barbarized version of the Roman Empire's army, with Normans, and maybe that's a little like what the Persians are. I think the Persians could give the Assyrians a run for their money, but there, there's not as much spit and polish, and there is more aristocratic tribal nobility, but their cavalry can fight like hell, and there's a lot of them. And they fight a little bit like the Scythians and the Huns and the Mongols and those people. They shoot you, you know, from a distance in small units with bows. Generally, it's thought that the big unit of cavalry would go over to near where it wants to attack, stay at a distance, and then send out subunits, you know, smaller squadrons who would then go up to where they want to attack, unleash all their javelins and arrows until they're out, ride back to the main body, and then another smaller squadron comes and repeats the process until the unit that they're firing at begins to get all disorganized, or their morale breaks, or they become so weakened that they're, you know, easy prey for the Persian infantry once they've run out of their two million missiles or however many it is to come and mop up. And of course, once an army broke and started to run away, all that Persian cavalry becomes absolutely lethal. They do nothing better cavalry than running down, fleeing, routing troops. Now, this cavalry was one of the most feared elements of the Persian army, and it worked in conjunction with the infantry. In fact, it's tempting to make a case that the Persians might have rationalized getting rid of all those close combat troops and replacing them with archers by suggesting that their overwhelming cavalry could make up for the difference and that their battle system required combining what the cavalry was probably doing on the flanks with what the infantry was doing in front and close cooperation would create a lethal combined arms sort of approach. 
when it worked. The Persians also had those guard units we talked about. They were called the Immortals, also called the Attendants or the Attendees, probably armored, may have fought in a similar way to the rest of the normal troops, but just at a higher quality level. Also, the Persians used mercenaries and hired them more and more, by the way, as the empire went on. And lastly, the empire could levy troops from its own empire, which is what it did with the main forces. The main forces are Persian and Median and Elamite and, and the troops from the center of the empire, but they had all these provinces stretching from modern-day Pakistan to modern-day Libya, up all the way to Afghanistan and down all the way to, like, practically Saudi Arabia. It's a huge territory, and they could levy troops from the entire thing. And when you read your Herodotus, by the way, he says that at least nominal units from all those areas showed up. The Persians ruled over like 80 different people. And Herodotus runs down more than 40 of them, you know, when he runs down the Persian army. So you have all these people we just talked about, but then you have all the exotic people from the periphery of the Persian Empire. And Herodotus talks about the Indian troops that are in the army. He talks about the troops from Africa who will paint half their body white and half their body red and tip their spears with antelope horn, black troops from modern-day Sudan. He'll talk about what he calls the black Ethiopians from India, which modern historians think are probably Dravidians because they're, they're dark, but they have straight hair and horsehair helmets. I mean, it's a wonderful exotic list, and historians think that part of what the Persians were doing is showing the flag a little bit to these people that they were fighting, basically saying, look at the breadth and scope of the people we can draw from. This is how big our empire is, that we encompass all these groups, and you're seeing just a small number of them. Imagine how many are back at home that we could call on if we needed them. Historians are unsure how much those troops played a role in a typical set-piece battle, but it just kind of shows the width and breadth of the Persian king of kings ability to call on troops, you know, as needed. And sometimes because of their specific skill, you know, I need this done, call up the Ethiopians. I mean, for example, that's how the, you know, Persians get the greatest navy in the world, like overnight. When they take over the Phoenician cities that are on the coast, they essentially, I would say subcontract, but there's no choice in the deal. It's like, you know, the CEO Darius of Persia Corps announces the acquisition of the Phoenician Navy. And now the Phoenician Navy is a division of Persia Corps. I mean, something like that. But that's how they are with everything, right? We take over the local institutions and we let you do things your way as much as possible. I mean, part of the fun of, of running a Persian army in ancient wargaming was that all these troops got to fight in their own local style. Again, that was sort of a subsidiary of the Persians letting you do things your way. They kind of go up to you according to the way we used to think anyway, and say, listen, what is it you do well? Well, we're very good at spear throwing. Okay, why don't you do that for us? You'll be just like the Phoenician Navy. They're really good on the water. According to historian J.F. Lazenby, he lists the Persian army's real strong points, and they're all sort of above the tactical level. He lists intelligence as something they do wonderfully. You know, reconnaissance, sending out diplomats and spies, and uh, merchants who report back, I mean, they usually know quite a bit about the territories around them. He cites diplomatic warfare as his number two thing that he says the Persians just have a huge advantage in. As we've been saying, they kind of are always ready to make a deal, measure the profit loss, you know, that kind of thing. And if you weren't so willing to make a deal, you know, when the Persian army was a long way away, they send diplomats with the army so that, you know, they just check back with you to make sure you're sure on that deal decision um, you know, when they have 30, 50, 100,000 men with them, armed, heavily. Lazenby says meticulous planning was one of their strong suits. And, you know, you would think that as inheritors of the whole Mesopotamian tradition, greatest record keepers in the ancient world, right, the Babylonians and Sumerians and all those people, you'd think that you inherited the ability to, you know, handle that sort of thing. Well, keep your records, keep your books, and be organized. But that actually played into how far away from the homeland you could move your armies. Because if you weren't a meticulous planner, those armies starve when they get a certain distance away. Every army is constrained by sort of a range of motion, you know, by how well you could supply it. And the sheer fact that what we call the Greek and Persian Wars will happen in Greece shows you, you know, how good the Persian planning was. They could project their power a long way. And finally... Lazenby says that they had an engineering expertise that he says was, quote, of a high order, end quote. Basically, the Greeks were 
you know, blown away by the Persian ability to bridge rivers, to dig canals, to knock down walls. And this is really key when you think about it. We've been comparing the Persian you know, approach and conquest of territories and expansion to the blob. But you could also think about it like really slow, thick lava. They just kind of, you know, when they have to reconquer territories, they just sort of go in there and one after another, slowly but surely knock down, reliably knock down the walls of the city, take it, move on to the next city. I mean, there's a very business-like approach to the whole thing. And if you weren't good at that, you wouldn't have been able to do what the Persians did. Too many cities had walls, and that was such a huge part of conquest. As I said before, I would love to see what this all looked like actually in battle. I actually go watch, by the way, you know, some of the worst riots you've ever seen that are on the Internet and everything, because you'll see oftentimes police who have big shields that are like the Romans, and they're kind of packed into formations, and you'll see the rioters on the other side and flinging things and, and attacking sometimes, and sometimes cavalry comes into it, and you think to yourself, okay, it, it, it's not really apples and apples at all, but there's certain, we get back to the physics of the battlefield elements to it, that make me think, okay, maybe this is a little what it's like. Look at how those two bodies of people move when they get close to each other. Look what happens when a horse enters the picture. I mean, maybe you can just get the tiniest taste of what the physics of battle that everybody up until the time period that gunpowder took over would have known instinctively or through experience or simply through common knowledge. According to ancient Greek authors, the Greeks had, especially before, you know, the big tangle happened, a healthy respect, a very healthy respect for the great king's armies and capabilities. And as we said, up until this time, this is an army that basically wins. But then sometime between 515 and 510 BCE, Darius decides to give this army one of those tests that are so difficult it would be a surprise if they didn't fail. Many great armies over history have failed a similar test, by the way. He decides to go invade the land occupied by the Central Asian nomads and becomes just another one of those, you know, leaders over time who found out that people who live on the wide open expenses of the steppe, whether in ancient times or 20th century versions of them, have the option of simply retreating into the interior, and then you have to follow them. Ask Napoleon how well that can work. And that was in an era, by the way, Napoleon's time, when there were cities and things that could be burned down and taken. The secret weapon of these people Darius tries to conquer is that there's nothing to conquer. They're nomads. There are no cities. There are no urban centers. And how do you, with your fantastic army, deal with them if their strategy to deal with you is to simply retreat in front of you and keep going and going and going while your supply lines get longer and longer and longer. Because guess what? You aren't Central Asian tribal nomadic horse archers, and you can't just supply a huge army, whatever that means, with lots of infantry and horses and camels and all sorts of things endlessly on a wild goose chase, or in this case, a wild centaur chase. Now, there are two reasons why this gets a ton of historical attention, because Darius had actually had to quell a revolt against Central Asian people right when he came to power. This gets a ton of attention, though, for two reasons. One, Herodotus makes it a key scene in his narrative. So when he's giving his performance, he has another opportunity to emphasize the wonderful, colorful nature of the Scythians. One of his favorite subjects, and let's be honest, one of mine, too, because if you're trying to entertain people, these people are the color. Brilliant historical color and fearsome and nasty and scary and full of all sorts of exotic customs. They play the same role in his story that Native Americans play in the old dime novel westerns, right? And there's a similar feel, by the way. I mean, Americans would recognize a lot of the same things because tribal people share certain qualities. And in the same way, for example that tribes would band together into confederations in the Americas. And we've always considered them, fairly or otherwise, to be uh, the next level in state development when you go from individual tribes to confederacies banding together into super tribes like the Iroquois Confederation. Well, they did this in this entire world of the Central Asian nomads. And so the tribes that we actually know the names of are, in fact, confederations of many tribes. And it's a hard enough army to try to deal with when the Central Asian, the barbarian, nomadic peoples from the steppe, that's the traditional, we would say today probably racist 
uh, cultural elite, a xenophobic, I mean, with a million names to describe how, how Herodotus's views of the barbarians are. But it's one thing to try to deal with them when they break into your territory. That's hard enough. Trying to deal with them in their territory, well, let's put it this way, it won't be too long you know, down into history where Macedonian armies from the period of Alexander the Great are leaving their bones you know, on these desolate steps trying to chase down these armies of horse nomads. In Herodotus's story, there are wonderful scenes. He, of course, makes it a personal thing. He puts dialogue in people's mouths. And the Scythians, you know, they play the Genghis Khan role in this story. They are a combination of merciless and menacing. And by the way, now, if you look at a map showing you know, the route that Darius took. He crosses that little strip of water that separates Europe from Asia, you know, in modern-day Turkey, becoming an invader now from the ancient Near East, stepping foot on European soil, and then moves through, you know, the area east of modern-day Romania and up into the southern Ukrainian area. I mean, it's an enormously long razzia or raid, burning, pillaging, looting, whatever there might be, in an attempt to somehow bring these people to battle. But they won't stop running. And Herodotus in his account writes, quote, As there seemed to be no end to this pursuit, which had gone on for a long time, Darius sent a horseman to Idan Thyrsos, king of the Scythians, with this message. You extraordinary man, why do you keep fleeing when you could certainly do otherwise? If you think you are able to challenge my power, then stop your wandering and stand to fight it out. Or, if you acknowledge that you are too weak for that course, then you should stop running away. Bring gifts of earth and water to your master and enter into negotiations with him. End quote. Sounds like a civilized, kingly approach, right? Let's settle this here and now. But that's not how they did business on the Central Asian steppes. And Herodotus has the reply from the very scary, you know, barbarian, Central Asian, you know, tribal leader. He writes, quote, To this, Iden Thyrsos, king of the Scythians, responded, This is my situation, Persian. I've never yet fled from anyone out of fear before, and I'm not fleeing from you now. What I have been doing is, in fact, no different from what I'm accustomed to do in times of peace. I'll tell you why I do not engage you now. It is because we have neither towns nor cultivated land to worry about being captured or raised, which might induce us to engage you in battle sooner. But if you really must come to battle without further delay, know that we do have ancestral graves. So come on then, find them and try to destroy them, and you will know whether or not we shall fight for the graves. But before that, we shall not engage you in battle unless we see fit to do so. He then says, quote, Instead of gifts of earth and water, I shall send you the kind of tokens you really merit. And in response to your claim to be my master, I tell you, weep. That is your answer from the Scythians. End quote. Weep. That's a great scene in Herodotus's movie, isn't it? So is this one, as recalled by historian M.A. Dandemiev. Quote. The Scythians did not dare risk a decisive battle against the huge army of their adversaries. They therefore resorted to their beloved scorched earth tactic. They retreated, taking with them their livestock, burning the grass, and filling in the water pits. In addition, Scythian cavalry repeatedly attacked and destroyed small Persian hunting parties. The Persians were worn out by their protracted pursuit of the Scythians deep into their own territory. When Darius was looking for a way out of this predicament, the Scythian leaders, in response to his demand that they would either come out for an open battle or submit voluntarily, sent a messenger to the Persian camp. Subsequently, if Herodotus is to be believed, Darius was presented by the messenger with a bird, a mouse, a frog, and five arrows. Darius thought that the Scythians thus announced their submission. Gabrius, however, one of the seven conspirators against Smyrdas, Bardia, gave a completely different explanation. If the Persians could not fly in the sky like birds, could not burrow into the ground like mice, or jump into the lakes like frogs, then they should expect to die by arrows. End quote. There's a lot of different ways to interpret this. Generally, it's always been considered to be some kind of a loss, and the Persians come struggling back to Asia, lucky to make it over a you know, bridge of boats held by Greeks 
But modern day historians look at this in a number of different ways. One of which is that these leaders, people who were descended from step tribes themselves, who dealt with them all the time, knew that you couldn't capture them or force them into battle. And so in effect, what they were doing was something like what the Chinese did for millennia to try to control the people on their border. Sometimes you have to just punch at them, just launch a raid essentially with a huge army, go smack them around. Sometimes you can depose their leaders and put in a client king, because as Dan Demiev points out, you can't actually you know, put a Persian ruler like a satrap to rule over these tribal peoples. They won't, you know, you can't. They have to have a, a tribal chieftain or something like that, but you can handpick that guy. So in other words, Darius might have just punched these tribes exactly how he wanted to. But the other thing that modern historians point out, in which case you almost have to look at this as a victory, is that when King Darius comes home, supposedly struggling with the Scythians close on his heels, he leaves a general in Thrace. Thrace is in the modern-day Balkans. And this general's orders are to continue the conquest and subject that entire area. That entire area is Europe, north of Greece, the northern part of the Black Sea, a place where cities like Athens depend on grain shipments that all of a sudden are threatened by an army whose capital is located in modern-day Iran, but these Persians are in the Balkans. This is the setup for what's about to happen. And what's about to happen kicks off with a revolt in cities that are in modern-day Turkey. Greek cities, but cities that were under Persian domination at this time. Many of these cities, you know, were in a province of, you know, what's now modern-day Turkey. Asia Minor called Ionia. So they're called Ionian Greeks, and this revolt is called the Ionian Revolt. And it'll go from like 499 to like 493 BCE. The Greeks were great colonizers and had cities all over the Mediterranean, not just the coast of Turkey on the Aegean like these cities. I mean, they had many of the islands in that whole region were Greek. They had colonies on the North African coast. They had um, one outside of Egypt. They had many on Sicily. They had some in Italy. They had some in southern France. I mean, these are great, you know, colonizers. And so they have cousins all over the Mediterranean, though. And it is to the mainland Greeks that the Ionians go for help after they rebel and realize, uh-oh, you know, we're screwed, right? If we don't get some help here, we're in terrible, terrible trouble. So they send a guy named Aristagoras, who's one of the leaders of this revolt, back to mainland Greece to essentially make a pitch, like a business proposition. And I know this whole show has a sort of a corporate business feel, but this is the way Herodotus portrays it. He actually has this guy go in here with like a PowerPoint presentation, first to the Spartans, and has him acting as a clever businessman to try to sell Sparta on intervention in their revolt against the Persians. And it's one of the great parts of Herodotus where, you know, essentially he has the story of Aristagoras first going to King Cleomenes of the Spartans. And remember, the Spartans had two of them, two kings. In this case, Aristagoras goes in there with his bronze tablet. So you think of your, you know, laptop PowerPoint presentation. And he sits down with the Spartan king and he starts giving him the rundown of all the good things you'll get if you invest in this, you know, Ionian revolt idea that I have here for you today. This is from my Purvis translation. And he translates, as he should, by the way, the word Greeks as Hellenes. So when we say Hellenes, we mean Greeks. And when we say Lacedaemonians, we mean Spartans. Quote, According to the account of the Lacedaemonians, when he went to talk with Cleomenes, Aristagoras had with him a bronze tablet on which a map of the entire world was engraved, including all rivers and every sea. To begin the discussion, Aristagoras said, Cleomenes, do not be surprised at my urgency in coming here, for this is how matters stand, that the sons of the Ionians are slaves instead of free men is a disgrace, and the most painful anguish to us but also to you, especially of all the others, inasmuch as you are the leaders of Hellas. So now, by the gods of the Hellenes, come rescue the Ionians from slavery. They are of the same blood as you, after all. This will be easy for you to accomplish, since the barbarians are not valiant, while you have attained the highest degree of excellence in war. 
Since they fight with bows and short spears, wearing trousers and turbans on their head, they're easily subdued. Further, the inhabitants of that continent possess more good things than all the other people of the world put together. To begin with, they have gold as well as silver, bronze, colorful clothing, beasts of burden and slaves, all of which could be yours if you really desired them." End quote. He then runs down every territory that the Persians have, at least the ones Herodotus knows about, and with each one he says what it has. This one has a lot of gold and silver. This one has a lot of cattle. You know, this one has a lot of slaves. In other words, you know, he's running down the benefits, right, of this business proposition of his. The leader of Sparta says, all right, go away. Let me think about this for a couple of days, and I'll come back and give you my answer. Okay, he comes back, and he asks a simple question of this Aristagoras guy. He says, so how far is it from where we are now to where this king is? He wants to know how far it is to the Persian capital. How far do I have to go to win this war that you're trying to sell me on? And Herodotus says, at this point, this business proposition goes sour when Aristagoras makes a key mistake when he takes the opportunity to not lie to the Spartans at this point. This is how Herodotus, from my De Selincourt translation, puts it, you know, right before they're supposed to meet again for the Spartans to give the answer as to how they feel about investing in this Ionian revolt thing. Quote, that was as far as they got at the moment. But when the day came on which Cleomenes had agreed to give his decision, and they met at the appointed place, he asked Aristagoras how far off Susa was, Susa the Persian capital, and how many days it took to reach it from the Ionian coast. Up to this, Aristagoras had been clever and had led Cleomenes on with great success. But in answering this question, he made a bad mistake. If he wanted to induce the Spartans to invade Asia, he never ought to have told them the truth. But he did and he said it took three months." End quote. Herodotus, writing 2,500 years ago, I mean, think this is a great scene, right? The, you almost think about him as the sort of the sleazy, you know, salesman type comes in here and tries to sort of put one over on the Spartan king, and then all of a sudden falls into the trap and says three months is how long it's going to take to get to the Persian capital, and Cleomenes basically says, get the hell out of here. He says, be out of Sparta by sundown. Are you crazy? and sort of instantly understands that this whole time, you know, he's been led on. And Herodotus says that, you know, Cleomenes goes back home and the sales guy follows him, tries to start bribing him, you know, to do the deal. Come on, well, I'll give you 50 talents if you do it. I'll give you 100 talents if you do it, that kind of thing. And, and Herodotus says a little Spartan boy, one of the sons of Cleomenes, was in the room and said something like, Daddy, you better get out of here because this man's going to corrupt you if things keep going the way they're going. It's another one of those stories about the uncorruptible Spartans. Now... Because he fails with the Spartans, this Aristagoras character then goes to the Athenians, who have been a democracy now for 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, it's a short, new kind of system they're running with there. And it's not like a democracy you or I would recognize. But as Herodotus points out, instead of having to convince a king or two in Sparta to invest in your idea, here you have to kind of convince the majority of whomever it is that makes the decisions here that they should invest in the idea. In other words, voters, whomever the heck that might be in an ancient democracy. This also from the De Selincourt translation, quote, It was at this moment, when the Athenians had made their decision and were already on bad terms with Persia, that Aristagoras of Miletus, who had been turned out of Sparta by Cleomenes, arrived in Athens. He knew that Athens at this time was the next most powerful state in Greece. Accordingly, he appeared before the people and made a speech in which he repeated the arguments he'd previously used at Sparta about all the good things to be found in Asia and the Persian methods of warfare, how they used neither shields nor spears and were easy to beat. In addition to this, he pointed out that Miletus had been founded by Athenian settlers, so it was only natural that the Athenians, powerful as they were, should help her out in her need. Indeed, so anxious was he to get Athenian aid that he promised everything that came into his head until at last he succeeded. Apparently, it's easier to impose upon a crowd than upon an individual. For Aristagoras, who had failed to impose upon Cleomenes, succeeded with 30,000 Athenians. Once persuaded to accede to Aristagoras's appeal, the Athenians passed a decree for the dispatch of 20 ships to Ionia, under the command of Melanthius, a distinguished Athenian. Herodotus then says, The sailing of this fleet was the beginning of trouble not only for Greece but for other peoples. End quote. 
that translation of that line differs book to book, um, translation to translation. But that's the Schwerpunkt. That's the moment when the Athenians decide to do something that's a little bit crazy because they essentially give in, and, and Herodotus sort of blames democracy for this, saying, you know, that one Spartan king could see the flaw in this dude's proposal, you know, from the get-go, right? Spotted the flaw, like the shark tank investor, venture capitalist said, get the heck out of here. Don't you try to cheat me. But 30,000 Athenian you know, voters, part of the electorate there, they could have the wool pulled over their eyes by a clever salesman, right? And the Athenians send 20 ships to go help the Ionian revolt. But 20 ships is not enough to do anything except get you in trouble. These Athenian ships will join with other ships. They will disembark and join rebellious Ionian troops who will, among other things, burn the provincial capital at Sardis, maybe accidentally. And then that army will get caught by one of the provincial Persian armies and crushed with heavy casualties. At this point, the Athenians, whose support for this Ionian revolt is kind of like not a little more than symbolic, but quite a bit less than useful, they kind of pull back and go, oh, yeah, you know, we're not that into it anymore. We can kind of see echoes in a in an inconsistent policy where public opinion just sort of changes, right? There's, there's no king here to say we're going to stay the course. The public wasn't sure anyway. And all of a sudden, maybe these Persians didn't look like the pushovers that the salesmen for the Ionian revolt said they'd be. Yeah, we're out. And hopefully, we'll just forget that this ever happened. Of course, Herodotus makes a point to say that Darius, of course, is not going to forget that it happened. And one of Herodotus's great stories revolves around, you know, Darius trying to make sure that he didn't forget amongst all his problems, you know, in his empire, those people, the Athenians. Herodotus' story talks about after the burning of Sardis and Darius gets the news about that. Quote, It is said that when Darius first heard this report, he disregarded the Ionians, since he knew that they at least would not escape punishment for their revolts. But he inquired as to who the Athenians were, and after he'd been told, he asked for a bow. He took the bow, set an arrow on the string, and shot the arrow toward the heavens. And as it flew high into the air, he said, Zeus, let it be granted to me to punish the Athenians. After saying this, he appointed one of his attendants to repeat to him three times whenever his dinner was served. My lord, remember the Athenians. End quote. That's how they did things back in the analog era. No word on whether the attendant's name was Siri. Nonetheless, great story, though it may be, probably either just totally false or, you know, another way to look at it is that this Athenian problem of Darius's was so small, he had to have someone remind him every day three times at dinner, otherwise he'd forget about it with all the things he had to deal with. To show you what a low priority this whole revolt is for the Persian Empire, the great king himself doesn't even worry about the Ionian revolt. He delegates it to an underling, and the Persians, like slow-moving lava, methodically reduce these rebellious cities in Asia Minor and off the coast. And it's often awful, you know, the retribution that these empires meet out to rebellious cities. But let's understand, that's, that's something that in much of the world is still treated rather harshly, and in this time period, standard operating procedure was an extreme human experience. So, for example, the home city of Aristagoras, the PowerPoint presenter of Herodotus, he gets his city leveled. Miletus is the name of it. And the men are for the most part killed, but the boys, we're told, are castrated and sent back to Persia to be eunuchs. The girls and women sold into slavery. And so if you don't look at Aristagoras the way Herodotus did, like some clever manipulator, and instead look at him as someone who one way or another gets involved in this revolt, but once you're in, the stakes are everything. I mean, you see what happened to his home city when it got, you know, retaken by the Persians. He knows what the stakes are. If you're thinking every man dies, every boy gets castrated, every woman and girl gets sold into slavery and your city's leveled, wouldn't you do anything? Wouldn't you, by hook or by crook, tell the Athenians anything that they needed to hear to get public opinion on your side enough to send help? And even though Herodotus sort of makes this Aristagoras in his movie version of events out to be a little like Professor Harold Hill in The Music Man coming in to sell River City on the idea of a boy's band with instruments that'll never show up 
and the people of Athens, or at least a sizable percentage of their electorate, as easily hoodwinked by Professor Hill, it's clear that for at least some Athenians, this issue of Ionian freedom for Greeks in Asia Minor is big and passionate and important. Historian Peter Green tells a story of a play that aired in Athens right after the Ionian Revolt collapsed. He says it may have been the first time that recent historical events, as opposed to myths, had been represented in the Athenian theater, and he writes, quote, In the early spring of 493, the dramatist Phrynichus put on a play called The Capture of Miletus, vividly depicting the collapse of the Ionian Revolt. The effect was remarkable. Phrynichus saw his audience weep tears of grief at patriotic shame. Stung into swift action, the pro-Persian lobby got the play banned. When in doubt, Green writes, fall back on censorship. Phrynichus himself was fined a thousand drachmas, almost three years' pay for the average working man. But the idea of subservience to Darius, however reasonable it might be, now rapidly lost ground. End quote. How modern does that sound? public opinion altered by a popular portrayal of events that were relatively current. And while historian Peter Green, writing in 1970, you know, shares an attitude that we probably would share today, living when and where we do, that censorship is not a good thing, censorship of the arts is not a good thing, and that public opinion should matter, right? In a democracy or a republic, it should matter. And remember, Athens is in what you could call the testing phase, maybe, of how this whole democracy thing is going to work. There certainly must have been other democratic experiments the world over, but Athens is credited with being the quote-end-quote first democracy. And they probably are, given the scale, you know, first major attempt at the experiment that is democracy, only 10 or 20 years old at this point. And if you're watching from the sidelines and you're a member of the conservative former but still powerful ruling class, and you're looking at how public opinion is doing so far at trying to, you know, govern things intelligently, they've already done something the Spartan king refused to do and got involved in a revolt that tweaked the nose of the great king of Persia that never had a chance of achieving anything really meaningful with the small amount of people they sent but was just enough to get you into trouble, you already did that. And now this playwright is writing plays that get them all fired up about confronting Persia because of all the injustices of Darth Vader and the evil star empire. If this is the same thing as, like, Remember the Main was, the newspaper campaign that fired up Americans in the Spanish-American War period to, you know, go to war with Spain... It's a little bit different because in that conflict, you could argue about historical justice and all that kind of stuff, but the United States was going to kick Spain's rear end. So propaganda that got public opinion to support the idea of kicking Spain's rear end is something that is not too detrimental to the country. This is much more like the people in Latvia being encouraged and their passions roused and a, and a, and a war fever stoked in order to confront the Russians or the Mexicans, you know, having the propaganda and the entertainment and public opinion and everything pushing towards, you know, going back and reconquering those states they lost to the United States a century and a half ago. That's something that in that case is public opinion leading you towards national suicide. And they'd already shown a propensity to get you into trouble. That's why you're on the, you know, great king's naughty list already. It's no wonder that guy was fined. You know, stoking those kinds of emotions at this time and at this place, that's an existential threat to Athens at this point. It is interesting, the ability to portray the Persians in such an evil light, though, because if you actually look, you know, at the Ionian Revolt and how the Persians dealt with it afterwards, they actually did so in a way that was just typical of their style. They punished the rebellious cities horribly, as we said, but then went in and tried to figure out why the Ionians kept revolting. Lowered some taxes in places, changed some trade deals in others, tried to alleviate the problem at its core. And ironically enough, because some of these cities that had revolted didn't like the tyrants that were ruling them, this newfangled thing called democracy, they wanted a piece of that too. The Persians let them have it. Remember, they were known for allowing local customs 
you know, to stay in place as long as things still worked out for them. And if the local custom was going to be to elect your own leaders in your own city, the Persians were fine with that as long as the city stayed loyal to Persia. So once again, the Persians kind of look like the place we'd all like to live if we had to live back in those days in a, you know, absolute monarchy, right? On the ancient monarchy scale, you know, they score very highly for leniency, tolerance, compassion, common sense. But if you're Greek, you're not going to look at it that way, at least not if you're Athenian. The last thing you want to do is have a king. You have a democracy now. And if you're Spartan, you want a king, but you want a Spartan king. The last thing you want is some barbarian king. So no people ever in the path of being conquered by any other people could see the upsides. Can you blame them? But, you know, I've always thought that if you were another city-state in Greece, remember, Greece is not a unified place. It's a bunch of competing, often warring, in some cases, bitter enemy city-states. Sparta's a city-state. Athens is a city-state. Thebes, Corinth, a bunch of places. Argos. What the Athenian democracy did by sending those 20 ships to aid the Ionian revolt is take the great king of kings gaze, the most powerful figure in the world, and turn it into your direction. And he doesn't just see Athens, he sees everything over there. What did the people in Argos do to deserve that? They might have eventually been absorbed by the blob, who knows? But the Athenians essentially declared war on Persia, but lived in a neighborhood that the Persians couldn't help but trample on on their way to punishing the Athenians. And this is partly why this story has magnified in terms of importance. For the people in Greece, this is life or death. To the Persians, this is a frontier disturbance. Historian A.T. Olmsted has a chapter, I love the title, it's Problems on the Greek Frontier. Historian George Cockwell entitled his whole book The Greek Wars instead of The Persian Wars because The Persian Wars makes it sound, you know, like the Greeks are talking about it because to them, that's what this was. But to the rest of the, you know, world that was centered around Mesopotamia, these were the Greek Wars, something over on the frontier, something that in no way you could ever imagine could threaten the empire. The Athenians, however, were doomed, and they knew it was coming. During this whole period, traditionally, there's a lot of focus on Athenian internal politics and the war party versus, you know, what the Athenians sometimes called collaborators. They had a word for it based on, you know, it was the Persians and the Medes, so they called it Medizing. When you were Medizing, you were talking about collaborating or giving in to the great king. And so they had these different factions led by different powerful families, you know, sort of sparring and fighting it out. And meanwhile, you know, the existential threat in 492 BCE gets going, led by a son of one of the assassination hit squad members who also happened to marry uh, into the royal family. So, you know, you can see how incestuous all this assassination hit squad thing is starting to be. His name is Mardonius. He's fascinating. I wish we knew more about him. He's an interesting, you know, Persian general. And he takes an army and a fleet working together in a way we would call land-sea operations today, and leaves Asia, crosses the Dardanelles into Europe. Now, nobody knows the size of this army. Herodotus says it was 300 ships. Take that with a grain of salt, but it doesn't matter if it's half that big. This is a mammoth operation for navies in the ancient world. The Persians, of course, did not create their own navy. They took over the best one in the world, and then they tasked it with things it never could have been tasked with before, like, okay, we want you to support a 20 or 30 or 40,000 man army with your navy. That's a new level of sophistication and operations. And what the Persians are doing in this conquest of Greece, which is something that they might have done in Egypt too earlier, but this is where you really get a chance to see it on display, is a precursor to you know, land sea operations today involving, you know, marine amphibious landings, everything. These fleets can be used to sit offshore and follow an army that's marching along the coast and feed it. Extending operations. Nobody knows how many troops Mardonius had, but he lands in this area controlled by Thracians. 
the entire region around the Balkans during this time period. And this particular area, of course, is up in, in sort of by where modern northeastern tip of Greece is, you know, up in that area, all a bunch of Thracian tribes. Herodotus labeled them the second most populous nation in the world after the Indians. And extremely warlike, he said that they would have conquered the world if they didn't love fighting each other too much. And they are, you know, you don't want to be so stereotypical about barbarians because all these people had wonderful cultures and values and, and religious beliefs and, and, and uh, you know, puberty rights. I mean, it's, it's all a part of it, but you can't help but look at a Thracian and think there's your Hollywood casting director's idea of a barbarian. They look a lot like a Scythian without the horse. They got the war paint, they got the tattoos, they like to, you know, carry severed heads around with them when they're trying to intimidate their enemies, and they're tough. And they like ambushes, and they like to kill prisoners. I mean, they scare people. And this area had submitted to Darius, this whole area, when he came along chasing those Scythians a while back. But, you know, the Persian army then goes home, and they kind of, you know, get a little lax, and yeah, we haven't heard from him in a while, and, you know, whatever. And then the army comes back and says, you know what, we're just going to tighten that relationship a little bit more and made all of those areas that had been formerly sort of just, yeah, we're your vassals kind of deal into official provinces run by governors appointed by the Persian king. One of these provinces is the, is the, is the next little kingdom, I guess you could say, on the way to Greece. So you go from Thrace to Macedonia. If the name rings a bell, the king at the time will... You know, ring it even harder. His name is Alexander, Alexander I of Macedonia. Do you know what he does when the Persian army under Mardonius shows up? He submits, becomes a governor under the control of the Persians, and some historians in a wonderful, ironic, twist of history say that if not for the stability and centralization and state-building climate that Persian control, you know, gave Macedonia during this period, they may never have coalesced into a strong centralized state that would eventually evolve into something that could destroy the very people who made that centralized state possible. Oh, and just for the fun of it, do it under a king with the same name. Don't you just love history? Nonetheless, the Thracian tribes do get one good sucker punch in on Mardonius before they get crushed brutally, a tribe of them will ambush the Persian army at night and create great havoc, including wounding Mardonius. Right around the same time, this fleet that is accompanying the Persian army will try to round a point called Mount Athos. And Herodotus says as soon, you know, it's like going around the tip of Florida. Think about it that way. And as soon as the fleet hits the tip, it gets hit by winds, strong winds according to Herodotus, and he says 300 ships sank and 20,000 men died. Here's what my Purvis translation of Herodotus says, quote, From Thassos the fleet crossed over and sailed close to the shore of the mainland up to Acanthos, from which they set out in an attempt to round Mount Athos. But as they were sailing around, a strong north wind came up on them, which was so impossible to deal with that it battered them badly and wrecked many of their ships against the shore of Mount Athos. In fact, it is said that about 300 of their ships were destroyed, with more than 20,000 men. And since this sea is full of savage creatures, some were snatched up and killed by them, while others were dashed against the sharp rocks. Some men perished because they did not know how to swim, and still others died from the cold. So that is what happened to the fleet there, end quote. I'm sorry, in my head right now, I just think to myself, what did that look like? 300 ships? 20,000 men? That's somewhere between 13 and 14 Titanics going down in terms of lives lost, if Herodotus' numbers are anywhere near correct. But even more from a visual standpoint is the idea of 300 ships wrecked, all, I mean, what did that, I mean, are they all bunched together in one place, or are they scattered around an entire coastline? I mean, what is the visual on this? If Herodotus is doing the movie, who's doing the cinematography on that? And how much do we have to use, you know, CGI computer graphics, because there's no way otherwise to, you know, show that scene? How much would it cost to do that 1950s Elizabeth Taylor Richard Burton style, right? Analog have to get 300 fake ships. and I mean, think about the visuals. It's just, 
all the people in the water. I mean, everything that people find so horrifying about going down in the Titanic, you have happening, you know, around Mount Athos. And, you know, when you think about the precariousness of maritime travel, I mean, bad storms will sink ships today, as we all know. Well, the farther back you go in history, in general, the more rickety these vessels become. During this period, they didn't even like to stray away from the coast very much. Standard operating procedure was to beach these ships at night, and then in the morning push them back out. And, get, and they're big ships, but you still beach them. 140 guys, I read, it took to uh, essentially lift a trireme onto the shore at night. So I wonder how much it took to actually give these, these fleets trouble. But the idea of 300 vessels going down when they rounded a cape, it, it's just, it boggles the mind. And yet you can find historical examples all over the place. I mean, the most famous has to be the kamikaze, right? The divine wind. When Japan was saved, you know, from the Mongol horde because the storm came up and battered the fleet, sank all these ships, scotched the invasion, right? Maybe this was Greece's own version of a kamikaze. But one thing that the Greeks knew is that this was not going to save them. This kamikaze was not a deliverer. It was a delayer. And in a mere two years, Darius will have his next invasion force ready. Understand something, 300 ships lost, 20,000 men lost. That will stop most ancient empires in their tracks. The Persians methodically just put together another one. You know, in 490, it's ready to go, and it is bigger. It is nastier. It is going to be handled better, and we're going to take into account everything we learned from the failures of the last expedition, and this time it is going to be aimed right at the heart of Athens. And it's tempting to see Darius in his CEO role as already seeing that the odds are massively in his favor. I mean, in the celestial casino in the sky, the battle between Athens and the Persians is off the books. They're not taking bets on that. There are no odds. There is no chance. And Darius is still trying to get a little edge here or there. He leaves no stone unturned planning-wise. He sends out envoys in the year between, you know, the first expedition that founders off the rocks of Mount Athos and the one coming up. He sends envoys to Greece. And they go to all these Greek states and these Greek islands and they ask for earth and water. Remember earlier we said that was the traditional token of submission. And most of these places give it to them. Vast majority of the islands, a bunch of Greek states. Two notable holdouts, though. Athens, who either throws their per